that's the better part of me right there. Amen. And so I am just blessed to have been to have married a woman of God. Amen. That is my back to back partner in ministry. And great things are taking place there in Ventura. Good things are happening. I'll share a little bit more about it in just a minute. But at first, I just want to thank God for my salvation. I've been saved, what they say, 27 years now or 26, 27 years. And I still thank God every single day that God saved me, that God reached me. I was only 12 years old when I gave my life to the Lord. I was 12 years old. I was about yay high and about yay wide. And I gave my life to God, and, it, I've, and I've stayed in his ways ever since. So that tells me that there's hope for this generation, that young people can serve God. That, that means that you don't have to experience the world. You ain't got to experience, amen, uh, the madness of the world, that you can be saved at a young age. And I thank God till this day for my Sunday school teacher that would take me to church every single Sunday. My family wasn't saved, but my Sunday school teacher would pick me up, take me to church, and I, that's where I began to say, man, I want to be able to do that for somebody one day. And now we're doing it. Now we're, now we're uh, serving God there in Ventura. Amen. And I thank God for what God is doing. I also want to thank the Third Wave LA team. Amen. Thank you, every single one of you guys. Amen. And I know that there's a team, part of the team missing. Amen. That, but they're not just missing. They're there in action. They're not just missing, but they're in action. Amen. And they're there in Amsterdam and the grand opening of our urban training center in Amsterdam. Praise the Lord. How many are great? How many are United We Can members? Amen. Thank God for our United We Can members that we're able to partner. Amen. And we're able to do this all over the world. We're able to reach and we're able to open up training centers. Amen. And so I want to encourage you to continue and to buy in into this vision. Can somebody say amen? Let me just share something about United We Can. If you're still a dollar a day, come on. This was now a dollar a day was introduced in 1993, where minimum wage was four dollars and twenty-five cents. Come on now. So if you're still making four dollars and twenty-five cents, I gotta pray for you. We gotta call EDD and the labor law side, amen. Because there's something wrong. I mean, no, we gotta grow, amen. Prices are going up. Gas prices are up. Come on. Lumber is up. Everything is up. Amen. We got to get our giving up. Can somebody say amen? amen? Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Right there where you're at, I want you to stand from all over this place, and I want you to open up your Bibles, and I want you to open them up to Hebrews chapter 11. And as you're opening them up, I also want to thank our founders, amen, Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie, amen. I want to thank them for just just their exampleship, their leadership, the legacy that they leave, be, they, they leave with us, amen? And we know that if it wasn't for what God did in their lives and through their lives, we wouldn't be here today. Can somebody say amen? amen. And so I also want to thank my pastor, Pastor Joe, amen? And I got launched out of the city of Whittier five years ago, and we got sent out to the city of Ventura, not knowing what was awaiting us there. Not, nothing promised, Nothing given, but just saying the call of God, simply the call of God. Amen. And so Hebrews chapter 11, when you have it, just go ahead and say, I got it. Verse 23. And it reads like this it says, by faith, Moses' parents it hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child. In other words, there was something special about him. And it says, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, somebody say he grew up. It says that when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Lord, I pray right now, God. 
That, Father, that you would, God, speak to your children, speak to your people here this morning, God. Father, you know, God, their condition. You know where they're at, God. And, God, even as I speak publicly, I pray that you would go down, God, every single aisle and preach privately to every heart, God. Father, remove me. God, I want nothing to do with what I say, God, but we want to hear you, God. We want to hear your voice, Lord. Father, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, we all say amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. This morning, I've entitled this message, Privileged to Promised. From privileged to promised. When we look at the life of Moses, and we read this scripture here in Hebrews chapter 11. We see that in, Ele in Hebrews chapter 11, we see a lot of men of God and a lot of uh, people that made a mark for the Lord. And this is accredited to them in chapter 11. But we see here Moses as a man that made some strong decisions within his life. A man that when it came to what he wanted, he chose Possibly the most unpopular decisions. He chose possibly what not everybody else would have chosen. What the, what the average person would have chosen might have been comfort and peace and luxury and fame. But when we look at the life of Moses, the Bible tells us that he moved from privileged to being promised. He moved from what, had, what he could have lived a life of luxury and comfort to live a life that would, be the, would live the promises of God. Here today, we know that God has given us promises. We know that God has given every single one of us a promise. If you don't have a promise from God, then listen, you got to get in your word. Because when you get in the word of God, you begin to discover the promises of God for your life. And the promises of God are very, are very peculiar and very important. And, and they're very personal to you and to I. Understand that we have a global vision. But God also wants to give you a vision, a vision for your family, a vision for your calling, a vision for your future, a vision, amen, uh, that you may be able to say, God, uh, I know that you didn't just create me just to exist, but you created me on purpose, with purpose. You designed me before I was in my mother's womb, and your word says that you already knew me. And so we know that the church is built on men and women that have promises from God. The church is never a place. It's never a location, but it's always a people. It's never, it's never a sacred building with statues and uh, with, uh, with, beautiful, uh, with, with beautiful ornaments. Uh, but it's always believing in the assembly of people that come together. It's not brick and mortar, but the church uh, is not, it's not the clothing you wear. But understand that the church is you and I. Can somebody say amen? Because Jesus didn't die for a building. Jesus didn't die for a structure he didn't die for a name on the wall Jesus died for people Jesus died for you and for me and the Bible tells us that even when we were sinners and even when we wanted nothing to do with him that he died on the cross for our sins can somebody say amen so we know that God designed us for it with, with a purpose. There's a purpose for our lives. We were born and we exist and we existed long, long before we even came to pass here on earth. It was in the spirit that we existed. We existed in the spirits. We existed before we were even born. Because how many know that, listen, you got to understand that the spirit is a lot more real than the physical. The spirit is a lot more real than the physical. We fight not against flesh and blood, but we fight, we fight against, uh, the, against the rulers and against, uh, against, uh, against the enemy. Can somebody say amen? And so when Moses, understand that when Moses freed the Jews from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God gave, given, gave him a promise. And God gave the Israelites a promise, and that promise was called the promised land. But understand this here this morning, church, that the good plans that God had given them 
would only happen and come to pass if they made the right decisions within their lives. God can give you great and mighty promises. And God can, can tell you that he has great things for you. And listen, you might have gotten prophesied one day. And somebody might have given you a word from God. Or you might have read in the word. And God gave you a promise for your life and for your future. But understand that, that it is you and I that carry the decision and the choices we make uh, that will take us to our promises. And that's what God says about our future. One of the greatest gifts that you and I have is the gift to choose. We have the gift to choose. You didn't have to be here this morning. You didn't have to show up this morning. We all have a choice. We choose. We, we, we have a choice. And that is a powerful thing that God has given us. But sadly, many times we misuse that power and we make bad choices. Can somebody say amen? Understand that what happens to you in life is not as important as the decisions you make. Choices matter more than circumstances. Choices matter more than circumstances. You make your choices and then they will make you. Listen, the choices you make will define who you will be. I remember that about five years ago we had a big choice to make. My wife and I had the bit, one of the biggest choices we ever had to make in our lives. Five years ago, the call of God came and it knocked on the, on the door of our hearts. And Pastor Sonny reached out and connected with us. And, he, you know, and, and there was a need, a need in Ventura to go and open up a church and go pioneer a new work. And it wasn't the most favorable conditions. At the, at the time, it was in the most favorable conditions for us to go step out. And as a matter of fact, for my wife and I to, to go, it was going to take us to release a lot and leave a lot behind. It was at the point in my career and a point in my life that things were good. The finances were well. The brook was running well. The ravens were coming and dropping off bread. Blessings were happening. Amen. Uh, the retirement fund was great. The 401k was good. Amen. The pension plan was fat. Come on now. Things were good. And it was at that time that I asked the Lord, I'm like, why would you call me right now? <laughs> This, is, this don't make no sense. And I remember that I thought at one point in my life that God was going to call us. And yeah, God was going to ask us to, to leave everything behind. But I, I, re, I remember asking the Lord or, 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 or having a, an agreement with God and say, God, I'll step out when you take everything away from me. I'll step out and I'll go when I no longer have the finances and I don't have the career and I don't have the house and I don't have uh, all these benefits. And when that day comes, then I will know that the brook has run dry and the ravens aren't bringing bread anymore and it's time to move on. And I remember, I'm like, well, this doesn't make sense with the agreement that you and I had, God, because right now things are good. And right now all the blessings and the money is there and things are going real well for us. So why would you call us now to leave everything behind? And I remember that I had to make a choice and I had to make a decision. So my wife and I, we had a, a, a matter of three days to make a decision on what we were going to do with the rest of our lives. That's pretty heavy right there. When do, you need a, when, when do you need a decision, Pastor Sonny? Give me three days. I'll give you three days. And I was like, all right, well. So in three days, we began to pray and we began to fast and we began to ask God. And we began to ask the Lord to speak to us. And I remember that it was right there in, a, in, in, right there in my bedroom, kneeling down, crying before the, before the Lord in heaven and asking God what he wanted for me and why he would call me now. If you're going to ask me to step out, I need to know why now. 
I need to know why right now. Why not later? Why is it that you want me to go now? And I remember hearing the voice of God. I remember so clearly hearing his voice and speaking into my heart and saying, uh, Son, my divine will and perfect will has never been to take anything from you. My perfect will is for you to surrender and to lay it down at my feet. If I have to do it, I will, but that's not my perfect will. My perfect will is for you to surrender when you have something to surrender. I'm here to declare to you that, look, listen, it doesn't matter what God asks for you. It can seem too big right now, but God is saying, I want you to surrender. I want you to lay it down. I want you to give it to me because if you give it to me, I'll take care of you. I'll make sure that I'm in my hand goes before you you're gonna see my miracles you're gonna see my hand open up doors that you couldn't open up by yourself I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that you see things that take place that you would have never seen had you never stepped out today today I am a blessed man Five years later, we are right now, we are occupying a 16 theater complex in Ventura. Amen. We're right there reaching the city. We're getting people into the church. We're getting people into our recovery homes. Uh, we're seeing an expansion take place, an acceleration happen right there in the city of Ventura. And things that we never thought could have been possible are being made possible. Who would have thought within a year's worth? That we would have able, been able to occupy a 74,000 square foot building. And say, God, only you, only you, only you are able to do that. Can somebody say amen? amen. And so we see that Moses had a choice here. He had a choice. He had a choice to either live in comfort or to answer the call. But before he had a choice... I want you to notice the scripture we read is that first God chose Moses. He was no ordinary child, the Bible says. I'm here to tell you that you're no ordinary people. <laughs> I'm here to declare to you that you're no ordinary people. You're no ordinary son and daughter of God. That there is something special about you. If you are part of the makeup of Third Wave LA, if you stepped into this building, I'm here to tell you, you are no ordinary person. And it's not by coincidence that God has brought you here. But. The next thing that happened, it was that Moses, his parents, began make, to make choices for him. The Bible says that they hid him. It wasn't his choice to be hidden. It wasn't his choice to be put into a basket, amen, and to be, and to be sent away. The, his parents made those choices for him. Because the Bible says that they weren't afraid. But the Bible also tells us that finally when Moses grew up, that finally, when he had grown up, he began to make some choices for himself. You ought to circle that when it says that when he had grown up. Because when you begin to grow up, you start making some grown-up choices. When you start growing up, you start making some mature choices. You see, it's okay for, uh, for Moses to have lived off, his, off of his parents' faith for a little while. It was okay for Moses to live off of his parents' convictions for a little while. But there had to come a point in his life when he was going to start having convictions for himself. There was going to come a point in his life that it wasn't his director, that it wasn't his leader, that it wasn't his pastor, that it wasn't his parents. It wasn't nobody else that was going to make the decisions and convictions for him. But he was going to begin to start having convictions for himself. Listen, if you're going to see the hand of God move within your life and within the church, you got to know that you need to be a man and a woman of convictions can somebody say amen? amen and he had a couple of life changing decisions that he made the first one is that he refused to live a lie he refused to live a lie God didn't create you to be what somebody else wants you to be he says by faith Moses in verse 24 when he had been grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He said, I'm not going to be just Pharaoh's grandson. 
That's not who I am. God didn't make me to live this life. I know my identity. I know what God called me to be. I know who I am on the inside. And you can clothe me with the fine linen. But listen, baby, inside, I am a Jew. Inside, I know I am not that. And so, therefore, I got to step out. I got to be with my people. I'm here to declare to you that God has given us a people. God God has given us an identity. God has given us a calling. God has given us a vision. And we may not be that. And we may not be that. But we are victory outreach. We are the people of God. We are. We know the vision that God has given us. Somebody give God glory here this morning. And so he had the choice to either pretend. He could have pretended all his life to be Pharaoh's grandson and live in fame and fortune. And live in luxury, the luxurious lifestyle, and live in privilege. Or he could acknowledge his true identity. He could acknowledge his true identity and be humiliated and thrown out and live a life of a slave and live a life of hard toil and be a laborious life. But he chose, he chose to not live a lie, but to live his true identity. I'm here to tell you that, look, listen, young people, understand that the world has an identity for you. Everybody has an identity for you. Culture has an identity for you. You can self-identify nowadays to be whatever you want to be. But you got to understand what God has called you to be. What God made you to be. He refused. You should highlight that word. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, the first thing he did, he refused. He refused to live a lie Romans chapter 12, verse 2 in the message translation, just listen to me. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking about it. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what God wants from you, and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God wants to bring the best out of you, and he develops you a well-formed, mature individual. Understand that we can't conform. We can't just let culture creep in. You can't just let traditions of the, of the, look, culture, the culture of this world is growing colder and colder. We're living in the last days. We're living in days, amen, uh, where over 100,000 babies are being aborted a day. That's more than what fits in SoFi Stadium every single day. My friend, there is a spiritual battle and things are going and getting worse and worse. But what God is looking for is for men and women that would rise up and say, I know what God has called me to do. I know what God has called me to be. And it's not that. It's not the other. It may be, it may be not the popular decision, but I'm going to do what God has called me to do. Do. Can somebody say amen? amen? That's real success, being who God made you to be. You know, there's a word for that authenticity. Being authentic. Being authentic. Not being a fake. Not, not being a counterfeit. I worked, I, I worked in the banking industry for many years, and I remember seeing a lot of counterfeits. Everybody, anybody ever held a counterfeit? Okay, some of you guys, all right, right there in the back. It's, normally, it's the back row that raises their hand, too. <laughs> on, love the back row. Amen. But it, it looks just like the real thing. It looks just like the real thing. But the problem is it does, doesn't have the same buying power. The problem is that when you put it to the test, it doesn't have the same buying power. You can look good on the outside, but when God puts you to the test, do you have the same power? You can look good on the outside. My friend, God's not interested in good-looking people. God is not 
sisters and, and pretty looking pray praisers. God is not looking for individuals that look good on the outside. God is looking for authentic men and women of God uh, that on the inside, oh, I may not have all the fine clothes uh, and I may not have all the nice gear, but one thing I do have, I have a pure heart uh, and I know how to seek God. I know how to grab a hold of him. I don't claim to be perfect and I don't claim to be without flaw, but one thing I do, I know how to surrender myself to the presence of God. That's what God is looking for. It's amazing how God will use an individuals like you and I that don't have to be perfect. Being authentic doesn't mean perfect. Being real doesn't mean being perfect. I'm a prime example. You're looking at a flawed man. You're looking at a man that has many flaws. And sometimes I wonder why, why, oh Lord, why would you use me? I think he just gets a kick out of it. Because he gets the glory. Because he gets the glory. When they said and when people thought he's too young, he's unexperienced, he's only 34 years old, he don't know a whole lot. It takes, a, it takes somebody that has more experience to go out there. And the, the situation is complex. I told the Lord, Lord, I, I don't have it. I don't have the experience. And I don't know how to do this. And God said, don't you worry about a thing. I will give you the wisdom. I will give you the insight. I will open up the door. Uh, that's the very reason I chose you because you don't know what you're doing because I'm going to step in uh, and I'm going to show off uh, and let the people know that I am the one that is with them it wasn't man, it wasn't a preacher it wasn't a leader it was me all along that was with them and so therefore I will open up doors that man cannot open somebody give God glory here this morning you got to decide in your life whether you want to impress people or you want to influence people. I, I decide that I want to influence people. Because you can, you can impress somebody from a distance, but you can only influence them when you're close to them. You can impress them from afar and, oh my God, you got the car and, oh my God, your Instagram account, how many followers you have and, oh man, all those, uh, all those places you go and the vacations you take. You can impress people from afar, but if you want to influence people, then you got to get close to the people, then you got to be there with the people, then you got to go out with the slaves, you got to go out with the laborers, you got to go out, amen, into the trenches and begin to influence people you're not going to influence them from a pulpit you're not going to influence them from your Instagram account the only way you'll be able to influence people is by getting in there with the people rolling up your sleeves and saying I'm here we're the same I may be called by God but I ain't no different than you and I I may have been given a title by God but I'm not different than you and I Sometimes I see in there, man, people that start out as servants and end up like celebrities. You start, you start out as a servant and you end up as a celebrity. I, that gets to me. That gets to me because I'm like, man... Aren't we still servants? Aren't we still just individuals that were saved by grace? Listen, there's no VIPs in the kingdom of God. There's no, look, listen, understand that God looks at you and says, you are my child. You are precious. Every single one of you have a great calling and a great destiny and a great purpose. And you got to understand that if you're going to influence people, you got to get in there with them. But the problem is we don't want to influence them and get right there with them because they're going to see our flaws. Because they're going to, they're going to point out our flaws. They're going to point out and they're going to see that we're human. That's all right. Let them see we're human. Let them see that we don't have it all together. Let them see that sometimes we mess up uh, because that's what brought us, us so long, so far. It's just getting right back up, getting back in the race. Can somebody say amen? The second thing you got that Moses did to go from privileged to, to promised is he, show, he chose short-term gain 
Short-term pain for long-term gain. Verse 25 says, Moses chose to be mistreated along the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. I mean, you know, that sin is only for a little while. Oh, it feels good. It feels good to sin. Oh, it feels good. The flesh, feel, it feels good. But it's only for a short while. It's only for a little bit. It ends up being emptiness. And so what Moses did is he was tired of that life. He was tired of the palace. He was tired of people being nice to him just because they had to be nice to him. He was tired of just living that life that it was just putting up a front. But deep inside he knew that something was missing. Deep inside he knew that, he, that there was a purpose for his life. And so you got to understand that there, we need to do some refusing and some choosing. We need to do some refusing and some choosing. You got to begin to take inventory of your life and say, what are the things I need to refuse and the things I need to choose? What are the things that I need to put away? I need to throw away in my life and I need to make some room so that God can do something greater within my life. Uh, recently, I started doing some spring cleaning. <laughs> My wife was like tripping out on me. I went on a rampage. I, I, because that's not normally me. I don't, I don't do, I don't do a whole lot of organizing. But I went on a rampage. I just got fed up with some things in the closet and some things uh, that had been piled up. And I'm like, what is this mess? Uh, and I began to just start sorting things out and looking at things. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe this thing was still here. And I was like, oh, my. I found some treasures, too. I found some things. I'm like, oh, this is good. I found a $1,000 run for old b &H card in there. That I was like, oh, my God, I didn't know we had that. Praise the Lord. But you got to understand that every so often you got to do inventory in your life and say, what are the things that don't belong there? What are the things that God needs to remove and God needs to get, that I need to get rid of? Uh, the things that have been piling up, there's times where you got to take some of the trash out. Uh, you got to take some mentalities out. There's some people that don't belong in your life. Uh, there's some things that don't belong in your life. Take inventory. If you want to go from privilege to promise, uh, then you got to do some refusing and begin to do some choosing. Can somebody say Amen. God begins to purify your heart when you do that. You, he begins to purify your heart. And if you have a pure heart, then listen, when you have a pure heart, then you can't have a pure heart and be a person of the world at the same time. I know it's not politically correct to say, be holy. I know it's not politically correct to say there's only two genders. I know it's not politically correct to say the truth. I know it's not politically correct, amen. But listen, that Jesus got crucified because he wasn't politically correct. When he was here on this world, he was he himself was not politically correct. And because he wouldn't join into their social justice, they crucified him. They hated on him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that it was Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. Have you ever heard that? Judas Iscariot. That was his political party. It was like saying Judas the, the Democrats or Judas the Independent or Judas the Republican. But because Jesus would not sign in into his social justice or into his political party, amen, he began and he betrayed Jesus. Understand that the world ain't going to like you. Some people are not going to be okay with your truth. Some people are not going to be okay for what you stand for. But that's all right. That's what God called us to do. God called us, amen, to speak the truth truth if everybody is okay and everybody loves your christian faith you got a problem your christian faith ought to provoke people People should feel uncomfortable. Be, why? Because it's the truth. And the truth is that we live in a world that is dying. And without Jesus, they're going to, to, to eternal damnation. Without Jesus, they're going to hell. Your family, my family, without Jesus, they're going to hell. We need to understand that God has called us to be an end time movement. We're an end time church. And we need to rise up and speak the truth no matter the cost can somebody say amen, amen. but you got to have a pure heart 
How can you speak the truth, amen, if you, if you, you, you claim to be righteous, but you're also ratchet at the same time? You speak heaven on Sunday, but you live like hell on Monday. How are people supposed to believe that? How are people supposed to believe that it's different in the house of God than it is in the world? I remember hearing a story of, uh, of a church that was, was out there in the Midwest and a tornado came. And the tornado came and it began to take rampage all over the city and houses were being blown. And, and so the people began to say, come in, come, 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 come to our church, come to our church. Get in here, get in here. There's safety inside here. There's safety. You can come in here, come in here. And so people began from all over the town come to the, inside of the church. And when they got inside of the church, lo and behold, the church didn't have a roof. And so when they went inside, they looked around and said, why did you have us come in here if it's no different in here than it is out there? Understand that things have to be different inside of the house of God. We are God's people. We have been called and separated by God to be holy unto him, to speak differently, to act differently, to love people, to have compassion on people, regardless of where they came from, regardless of the background, regardless how many times they've fallen, regardless how many times they've messed up. Thank God somebody loved you. Thank God somebody reached out to you. Thank God somebody embraced you when nobody wanted to embrace you God embraced you the people of God embraced you the Bible says in John chapter 15 verse 19 that if you belong to the world it would love you as its own as it is you do not belong to the world but I have chosen you out of the world that is why the world hates you you should celebrate the haters you should celebrate them because that's what the Bible says blessed is those who are persecuted because of righteousness. If people want to unfriend you, let them unfriend you. If people don't want to go in your journey, let them not go on your journey. Quit trying to hold on to people that God has already removed out of your life. Quit going back and trying to build old connections that God says uh, they have nothing to do with your destiny, have nothing to do with your future. But it's your choice. We can't make you. I can't force you. You're only as close to God as you want to be. And then you can't blame others for the direction of your life. People can hurt you. People can harm you. People can scar you. But no one can ruin your life. You may be a product of your past, but you're not a prisoner of it. You are free to choose but you're not free from the consequences. You'll have pain in life, either now or later, that's gonna, be, that's gonna happen. But God, will, God uses pain for us to grow. Romans 5, 3, 4 says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength and character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. The third thing that Moses did is that he chose what God values, not what culture values. Verse 26, it says that Moses regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now that word regarded, it means to evaluate. It means to consider. It means to appraise. In other words, he didn't make a dumb decision. He didn't make a blind decision. He regarded, he appraised, he, he, he took inventory and he said, okay, what, what, he, he wanted to make a sound decision because he knew that this was going to affect the rest of his life. Listen, there's going to be crossroads in your life. You're going to find yourself at forks of the road and you cannot follow what everybody else is doing. You can't follow and, say, and just say what your family's telling you to do. You got to go before the Lord in heaven and say, I'm going going to evaluate. I'm going to consider this and I'm going to hear what you have to say, Lord. And because God tells you, because God says, uh, then you begin to obey and walk in obedience. Somebody say amen. amen. He made a value judgment. 
and he clarified what mattered most. If I asked you this morning, can you identify the top, your top three values in life? Could you identify them? If you can't identify them, then you can't live by them. If you can't identify what you value, then you can't live by it. If you're hearing what somebody else is telling you, somebody else's values, then listen, you're not going to live by it. The day is going to come when you're going to be tested and you're not going to live by those values because it was somebody else that was somebody else's values. But when you begin to identify your own values, you have a conviction of the word of God. You have a conviction, a personal conviction of your own relationship with Christ. But then those times will come and you will be able to stand the test of the trial. You'll be able able to stand those tests. Why? Because you're a man and a woman that understands your biblical values and your own convictions with God. Can somebody say amen? If you don't decide what matters most, then others will. Others will decide what matters most. And we see what the world values today. It values popularity, prestige, power, to be famous. It values pleasure. It values possessions. I like what Joshua 24, 15 says. It says, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my, look, I don't, I can care less where, what, you, what you're doing. I know what I got to do. I know what God has called me to do. I know what, where, God, what, where God has called me. I know. And so as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Can somebody say amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I love this story of Moses because it gives us hope. Because Moses wasn't a perfect man. Moses was a man that had anger issues. He struck the rock. Moses was a man that had a hot temper. He killed and murdered a man. But yet, God chose him. Did God know he was going to do that? Yeah, God knew. Did God know that he was going to blow it? God absolutely knew. But did God still decide to choose a man that would be surrendered? Did God still choose, chose to use a man that would make those hard decisions in life? We need to begin to look at people with the same eyes of grace and mercy, of forgiveness and mercy. I must speak to those that have leadership and authority. Listen, if you have authority, it's because God has given you authority. Because all authority comes from God. But the Bible says that blessed are the merciful. Our generation needs mercy and grace, man. We need to love people. We need to love people. Not for what they have in their hands, but what they have in their hearts. We need to love people not for what they have to offer, but just simply because of who they are. So how do we show mercy and forgiveness? When I look at the life of Moses, God showed him mercy and forgiveness. God used him despite of his failures. It said that John Wesley visited a colony of Georgia and somebody mentioned about an incident involving a man who had angered them and said, I will never forgive that man. John Wesley responded, then, sir, I hope that you never sin. Because understand that where we draw the line of grace and mercy is the line that you and I will be judged by. Where you draw the line of grace and mercy is that same line that you're going to be judged by. We got to love people. 
We got to embrace people. We got to we got to restore people. I pray that Third Wave LA is a house of restoration. I pray that Third Wave LA is a house where people can come. And they might have blown it so many times. And they might have a jacket. But when they come, that jacket just falls right out the door. When they come... They come with a fresh, clean slate to the house of God. And that this may be a place of restoration. That they may, this may be a place of forgiveness, of grace and mercy. It's sad that many times the church will say, we forgive you, but we don't empower you anymore. People that fall sometimes in ministry... Moses, again, he blew it, and he, he, he was a murderer. But yet God still decided to use him. People that sometimes fall in ministry, we don't receive from them anymore. We don't empower them anymore. We don't restore people. We just store them until the clock runs out on them. We need to embrace people. Give somebody, give them another opportunity. Give them another shot. I've learned something this last five years. Listen, I've learned one thing is that I don't take anything personal. I love people. I love them for who they are. And I know that if God can use someone like me and give me opportunity, then I got to show somebody else an opportunity. I can't disregard them. I can't just write them out. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. We need to restore. We need to restore people. We can't ignore them. We need to restore them. It trips me out how the world can do a whole lot better job than sometimes does at the church at Restoration. You look at Magic Johnson. When you look at Tiger Woods, Robert Downey Jr., Martha Stewart. And you see that there are success stories now in the world. But what about in the house of God? I'll forgive you, but I won't restore you. No, we got to understand that God's grace and God's mercy, it covers us and it covers a multitude. Love covers a multitude of sin. And understand that if that God has a calling for every single person, regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you've been, regardless of how bad you've blown it, and you feel like you can't do it anymore, you feel like you can't go on anymore, I'm here to tell you that here is a place where people can be restored. This is a house where people can rise up and begin to walk in their calling. We need men and women that love people, restore people, are able to pick people right back up, put them back on the, on the, on the path of their calling, on the path of their purpose, and say, I still believe in you. Here's the ball, take another shot. Here's the ball, take another shot. Here's the ball, take another shot. I know you missed it. I know you missed it, but we're going to keep on trying until you make it. We're going to keep on going until you make it we're gonna take you along the journey and get on board baby get on board get on board get on board oh yes jesus listen this morning you have some choices to make they have decisions in your life i'm here to tell you that your decisions will determine your future your decisions will determine where you will be 10 years from now i could have been back at home in Whittier. And I could have been there and it might have been okay, but it wouldn't have been God's best. This morning, I don't know what you need to go before the Lord. If you know that your heart, you need to hear from God's voice, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this altar and I want you to come forward. I want you to make your way from all over this place. And I want hey, you this to is Pastor Ryan, and we want to thank you for joining us here today. We believe that this message has not only spoken to you, but also challenged you. And there are three things that we want you to do here today. The first thing is like this video. Secondly, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thirdly, share this video with someone you know that needs to be transformed. Listen, this is Third Wave LA, where hope is found 
and your purpose is lived out.